Hello and welcome to State View, a program that helps you to stay informed what's happening on Beacon Hill and how does that uh, play into what's happening in your neighborhood. Uh, today uh, joining me is State Senator from the Plymouth and Norfolk District. Uh, that would be Senator Keenan. Senator, uh, welcome back. Great to be back. Nice to see you. It's great to have you again, uh, once okay. again in person here at uh, QA TV. Uh, as we are meeting, uh, COVID is still an issue. Uh, we yes. know that the variant um, is uh, making cases tick slowly back up. Uh, your thoughts, I know that the, there was a uh, meeting regarding uh, guidelines yes. and you had actually proposed uh, getting folks uh, kind of taking away the, the Zoom component and getting more in person. Um, that unfortunately uh, for you didn't pass. The legislation was to address how public meetings would go uh, going forward and my my hope was that we would have elected officials back in whether it be uh, on the, the select board meeting room, the city council chamber, or, or in the state senate or in the house of representatives, that they would be safeguards put in place. That if that means masked, then it would be masked. But that would be for the elected people conducting the the hearings and their meetings, and to still allow for remote participation by the public. And I think even beyond COVID. Once we're all back to conducting our meetings in person, giving the public the opportunity to to participating, particularly in a hearing, uh, remotely, I think is something that should be permanent. Never lose that component, but simply have the players back yes. in the same room is what you were right. The government, proposing. in my experience, in government has been so much a people person, and when you're dealing with your colleagues, so much of it is personal interaction, and you just don't have that when you do it by Zoom. For instance, at the State House and in the, the Senate, we have a Democratic caucus pretty much every week. And normally that's a time where we would sit down, <coughs> excuse me, maybe have lunch together and chat about children or sporting events and about legislation. And you just had that, you built that relationship. And uh, that's missing now, and it has been missing for the last 15, 16, 17 months. And I think that's critically important. So if the variant doesn't raise to the level of where it's out of control, that if we can get back into our respective meeting halls and chambers and do so safely, and if that means wearing masks, that we do that, and, and we allow for public participation, I think that's best for government. I don't think government works well when it's all done remotely. Let's talk about the budget, because now the governor has signed off on the budget. Uh, he did so on July 16th. It's a four, 470, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, $47.6 billion. See, where the glasses come yes. into play? <laughs> yeah, we just talked about uh, that. $47.6 $47 billion budget. Uh, talk about um, maybe the efforts of, of the Senate and the budget overall. Yeah, so the, the process is that the governor introduces his budget and then the House will do their budget and the Senate does its own budget. There was concern, obviously, a year ago that this was going to be a very difficult financial year. Not only the fiscal year that we just finished, 2021, but this fiscal year, 2022, that we just have entered. Um, and so lacking, lacking receipts, I would imagine. Lacking revenues, ex exactly. There was a real concern. We had told our towns last year, and the towns in my district, and pretty much everybody told the municipalities, plan on somewhere about an 8 or 10 percent cut. But uh, through a combination of our rainy day fund, uh, federal money, uh, and uh, additional state spending, um, I mean, additional and, and some state revenues, we were able to balance things out pretty well. This past year, uh, it ended up the revenues were much higher than we thought. And so going into the current fiscal year, which began July 1st, uh, it's been a pretty good situation. And we've been able to do local aid through Chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid at levels that we really didn't anticipate. So revenues are up. We did not have to draw from our stabilization account this year. In fact, we'll be making a contribution to our rainy day account. And the hope is that that account will be over $5 billion by the end of the fiscal year, which will be one of the highest we've had. Still not high enough, but so much better than what we anticipated a year ago. And so, uh, but I think we have to be very prudent and cautious going forward on how we deal with the federal money, uh, the revenues that we do have at the state level. Uh, I think we have to be very cautious on how we spend those, making sure that we don't get ourselves into a pattern where we can't sustain it. Talking about the uh, budget supplemental line, uh, talk about uh, some of those uh, items. And I guess I'm, I'm looking at uh, the extension of voting by mail. Yes, yeah, so we passed uh, for the last fiscal year, we recently passed a supplemental budget to kind of close out some accounts. And included in that budget were uh, provisions for the extension of 
uh, vote by mail, for instance, and early voting. Uh, communities can opt out of the early voting in particular if they wish to, uh, but and, and vote by mail. But the idea was to extend those provisions. In talking with the clerks from the communities that I represent, they thought that last year's election went very well, that they were able to do what they had to do with early voting and with uh, vote by mail. It went really well, and I give them all kinds of credit because it was put upon them very quickly because of COVID. They responded really well. They put their teams in place. They got the training out there. And uh, in general, it went really well. And so it's not a big step to continue those provisions through the fall elections. And then um, the legislature is working on a more comprehensive voting bill that we will probably take up in the fall to decide what we keep permanently going forward. Also, uh, we'll get into this rather hefty issue, and that is public transportation and the MBTA. Talk about oversight. Uh, proposal uh, regarding the MBTA and oversight into their function. Yes, yeah, so in the supplemental budget we also had a provision relative to the uh, oversight of the MBTA. A few years back, and I don't remember exactly how many, they put in place a fiscal management control board. Uh, I, I strongly supported that. I thought that it should have been made permanent at the time that it was introduced. It was introduced, extended, and then it expired this uh, past June, I think it was. So there was a decision that had to be made whether to put another board in place or just to allow the MBTA to operate as the MBTA with some oversight perhaps by the Department of Transportation. So the end result was that there is now a, a board of directors that will oversee the MBTA. That was included in the supplemental budget. It's been passed and it will give this new board the ability to set policy that the general manager of the MBTA will then implement. And so I think it gives continuity to the leadership of the MBTA and it gives stability to leadership at the MBTA and I think that board working with General Manager Poftak who I think is doing a great job considering the circumstances I think it will uh, it's the best approach for the MBTA going forward. And how has COVID seriously affected and we know it has seriously affected has. intake uh, in regard to receipts coming into the MBTA? Pretty dramatically. Uh, use of the MBTA across all uh, lines and on buses is, is still down. Uh, the commuter rail is really uh, has not rebounded much at all. Different lines have responded differently with the easing of some of the restrictions. The blue line was pr I believe the one that had the most ridership throughout the pandemic and continues to do pretty well but the other subway lines they uh, ridership is increasing but it's nowhere near what it was pre-pandemic and the same on buses and so when you don't have the riders you don't have the fare revenue and that impacts the, in, the ability of the MBTA to provide the regular service that you hope to have to draw riders back. So it's this bit of a cycle, but I, I think we will get through it. There's a commitment from the MBTA to, to provide regular service. Uh, most of the service is at or near pandemic levels, meaning frequency of service, um, at or near pre-pandemic levels, not quite there. And then the MBTA is also looking at what they learned from the pandemic to determine do they have to adjust some routes going forward? Do they have to adjust some timing? Do they have to adjust their fare system, their fare collection system going forward? What about, um, we know, of course, the ferry service was looked at uh, yes. seriously by them as well. Yes, we continue to push the MBTA to look at the ferry service, but w with everything else, uh, for instance, the Hingham Ferry was taken out of service pretty early uh, during the pandemic. That's back. Uh, right now, we do have the uh, ferry service running from Squanton Point Park to Boston on a schedule. The goal is, as it always has been, to get safe, reliable, predictable uh, service from Squanton Point Park to downtown Boston. Uh, I know that our federal delegation is, is working in Washington with the uh, infrastructure money that will hopefully come to include ferry service, not only from Squanton Point Park, but from other areas, because it, it's just, it really is a, a critical component. And as we move forward, and people may be a little hesitant about getting on a crowded red line train where you know, when I would take the red line to work, you know, there'd be people four inches away from you. And so people would be obviously and legitimately concerned about that. The ferry is a great op alternative to easing the congestion, going outside, and uh, making, you know, and then you'll have less of that crowding on the MBTA when we get back to the level where it's pretty high. And I'd like to talk uh, specifically, I guess, on the trains at this point and wonder how COVID has affected the rollout of the new trains. It, it did have an impact. Uh, the trains are being assembled out in Springfield. 
They're manufactured by a Chinese corporation. They're assembled out in Springfield. There uh, were some supply issues that slowed down the rollout. And then also we had an orange line derailment that caused some concerns. So for instance, the new red line trains that had been put in service, they were taken out of service uh, just as a precaution while the MBTA tried to really narrow down the possible causes for the orange line uh, derailment. And so once that's determined, they'll adjust red line trains if they have to or fix them and then they'll go back in service. But yes, the production was slowed. Um, I'm told that it's, it's gearing up again and is um, you know, reaching kind of the level of production that it was at, but it, it did have an impact on delivery. And looking into the future, I know you were part of a presentation regarding electric vehicles and electric buses for the MBTA. Yes, so a couple things going on there. One at the low site on Bergen Parkway, that uh, has been purchased by the MBTA and will become a modern state-of-the-art bus facility. It will replace the one that's on Hancock Street by Veterans Stadium, which is just in really so outdated. I've been down there a couple times, and if they want to do something under the one side of the bus, they've got to pull it in so they can get underneath it. And then if they want to do the same thing the other side of the bus, they've got to back it out, pull it in, angle it right so they can get under that side of the bus. This will be a facility that's state-of-the-art. All buses will be stored inside, and it will have the ability to meet the demands of an all-electric fleet. And I give a lot of credit to people uh, on the South Shore, in Quincy in particular, people who are active in promoting uh, electrification of cars and buses. They, I believe, were responsible for the MBTA to become a little bit more aggressive on introducing electric, battery electric buses into the fleet. So great work by uh, you know, citizens who were concerned about it. And uh, you know, this, this new bus depot down in a bus facility in Quincy will be a, a hub for this type of technology and we'll see clean buses rolling through our neighborhoods, which is great. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, housing, and I know you uh, participated um, in a joint committee on housing. Uh, what, um, what was the takeaway from that hearing? We need housing. Yeah. Um, I, I serve as the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Housing, and so we have been talking to people all over the state and getting out and about, and the need for housing just can't be understated, or can't be overstated. Uh, it's and just enormous. And you look, I mean, Quincy seems to be doing a lot of building. Uh, how about other areas of your district? Uh, other areas uh, have been doing some, not as much as Quincy. Uh, what's impacting development in some of the communities I represent and other communities across the Commonwealth is that they do not have the water and sewer infrastructure to support large-scale development. For instance, even down at Union Point, the uh, South Weymouth Naval Air Station, which has seen a lot of development, there's a cap on the development there that uh, will limit any further development, and it's due to infrastructure, water and sewer issues. In Rockland and in Abington, both communities have a 40B low and moderate income housing proposals for the communities. And generally those are proposed because there's concern about impact on the school system and on traffic. In these two communities, the real concern is, is there a sufficient water supply and sewer capacity to meet the demands of these two developments? It remains to be seen whether that's the case. That'll go th they're making their way through the process, but that's pretty common across the Commonwealth but there is just an enormous demand. Quincy has done a lot, uh, and other communities, we're trying to push them to do additional housing as well. But I hear it, you know, in, in Quincy, people will say, uh, my children aren't going to be able to live in Quincy, they can't afford it. And the answer to making it affordable is to increase the supply. And then there's uh, some opposition to increasing the supply. So I think it comes down to making sure that if there's to be development in the city, which is needed, residential, it has to be in the right places and uh, have as minimal impact on our, our neighborhoods as possible and make sure that we have the infrastructure in place, whether it be physical infrastructure like water and sewer, but also support infrastructure like schools and so forth to, to meet um, you know, whatever the population is, uh, the needs of the populations in, in the new developments. There's a demand in every community. Absolutely. Uh, it's the same thing people are saying, you know, where are my children going to, to buy a home? And then there is a concern about overdevelopment. How do, we, how do we balance those two? That's the real challenge. And we have some laws in the books that I think serve as a disincentive to promoting smart housing development. And they just, I don't think they've worked over the years. And so I think we've got to give some more thought as to doing things differently. And we have some federal money that is coming to the state uh, this com uh, tomorrow, the June 27th, we'll have a hearing uh, relative to spending those federal funds on housing. 
But I think we've got to be thoughtful and really do some good planning before we just start throwing money into housing. I think we've got to make sure that we do it the right way. We have a lot of projects in the pipeline uh, for affordable housing, and uh, I think we've got to try to fund those. And I think we've got to recognize affordable housing is housing that's affordable. And, um, you know, my children, they're finding housing right now not affordable. So when people hear affordable housing, workforce housing, what's the difference between those two terms? So uh, generally it's kind of by tier. It's, it's affordable housing where you are governed by your income levels and your as asset levels. And, you know, it, depending on the project, it could be 100% uh, of median family income or, or whatever the formula is that may apply to a certain development. And then there's workforce, which you know, is designed to people that may be working and have a, a, a higher level of income but still can't come up with down payment, for instance. And then there's market rate. And we have a, a development in Quincy called the Watson down by the shipyard that has affordable uh, workforce and market. And it's a great, great building. It's a great program. And uh, it's great development. And that, is, I think, is kind of a model going forward. And, you know, affordable housing, people have this image of rundown housing, and that's just not the case anymore. M most people who live in affordable housing are working. And um, it's just that they're not making enough. They may be working two jobs at $15 an hour. And you're not going to be able to buy a house on that. Absolutely. Uh, talk about, uh, let's switch gears and, and talk about uh, the testifying that was done before the Joint uh, Committee on uh, Mental Health. And uh, specifically, I guess, looking at services and coverage for those services. So, th yeah, there's a, a, a few things. One of the things that we have found before the pandemic, and particularly during the pandemic, is that young people are uh, really having difficulty accessing our mental health system. So one of the bills that we've in introduced would be to uh, put an ombudsperson in place to kind of a resource for people who are trying to work their way through what's a complicated system. And the other thing that we've, we've tried to address is that if somebody goes to the emergency department, for instance, with an acute mental health situation, oftentimes they are cleared medically, they are evaluated in terms of their mental health, and there may be a recommendation as to what's next for them. But then there's a lot of hurdles that they have to go through from an insurance perspective. There has to be prior authorization and, or approval of the next step of treatment. And we don't require that if you go in with a broken arm, but for whatever reason we require it if you go in with an acute mental health si situation. So we're trying to to remove... It's almost not treated the same. It, it's not treated the same. And I go back a, a few years, when Quincy Medical Center was, was open, I asked them to pull some data, and there was a day where somebody walked through the doors of the emergency department with uh, a heart attack, was, was brought in by stretcher on a uh, relative heart attack, and a person that came in with an acute mental health situation. The person who came in with a medical, with a heart attack, a medical condition, was within 45 minutes had been stabilized and shipped off to a downtown Boston hospital person who came in with a mental health situation had to wait, was asked about insurance, the insurance company had to be called, they ultimately were cleared medically, then they were waited for their evaluation, and once their evaluation was done, then they waited for the insurance company to go through their networks to find out whether they were going to approve the next level of treatment. And meanwhile, the person with the heart attack was probably home walking at, at that point. Um, the other thing that we've, we've done is that we have found that um, it's very difficult to get outpatient mental health treatment. That you may need treatment and you go to your insurer and they say, oh, here's a list of our providers. And then you start calling those lists and they, they're not accepting patients. Or they're only accepting patients on a cash basis. They're not accepting patients with insurance. So we, uh, one of the pieces of legislation we filed is to kind of set up a commission to get to what it is that's causing that and try to address that so that more people will have equal access to our behavioral health system. What about um, something called MAC? It's the More Affordable Care Act. Yeah, so that's on, that's on the um, medical side of things. Right. And what it basically does is try to control cost. You know, people with chronic conditions, uh, for many, the co-pays and deductibles that they have to cover through their insurance is a disincentive to stay on their medication on a daily basis. And so, for instance, somebody that uh, requires insulin daily, if there's a time when they can't afford that and they don't take the insulin, they may end up in the emergency department. They may end up being admitted to the hospital for two or three days, and that cost is enormous. So the MAC Act, one of the things it would do would be to basically eliminate the co-pays 
for medications for seven chronic conditions, for instance, like asthma and, and uh, diabetes and, and things like that, with the idea that we want to keep people healthy in their homes. And if that means waiving the copays, um, that's the approach. And the goal is that they won't cycle down health-wise and end up in our emergency departments and in our hospitals for extended stays. And there's a lot of science to suggest that this works. Well, because then again, like you said, it's, it's not um, hard to believe that those costs suddenly skyrocket. Yes. Oh, you know, I, I visit the emergency department and I mean, overnight stay is thousands of dollars. And what's the cost of insulin? You know, a copay. Right. $10, $20, $50, $80. And so if you think, you know, waive those costs, people will stick to the medications and have longer term positive health impacts on their own lives, but also on the, uh, the healthcare delivery system. Talk about, um, always we talk about the COVID, I'm sorry, the COVID, the opioid epidemic. Uh, that hasn't ceased. Matter of fact, I think numbers are going up. I think it was overshadowed by COVID. It, it was, and it was caused I think to a large extent by, uh, as we, by COVID. So we just talked about having access to medications, for instance, to keep you stable and out of the hospital. Well, for people who are in recovery, access to their daily treatment program, whether it's medication assisted treatment, even AA, whatever you know, path to recovery, or recovery path they're on, that daily access is critical. And they weren't able to get that access during COVID. Uh, and, and that had, I think, a, a pretty severe impact. We saw the number of overdose deaths rise. People were not able to get treatment. They were isolated from their support systems. And as a result, we, we saw the negative impacts of that. And, it, and it's kind of tragic. So there's a renewed effort to, to get back into making sure that the systems we had in place uh, are funded again and that they are even more robust. And while we were able to do some things, the state was, and providers were able to do some things through telehealth, for people in recovery, that personal contact is, is so important. And so we want to get back to that, but also to continue providing the telehealth option and making sure that the rates of reimbursement for telehealth are enough that uh, you, can, you can reach some of these people who you might otherwise not. That was certainly a rethinking of the system, telehealth, uh, that whole concept. Yes, I, I just uh, this morning was meeting with Aspire, which is a, a behavioral health provider, for instance, in, in Quincy. And telehealth was very helpful to them with their clients during COVID. And having the same rate of reimbursement is absolutely critical uh, for them so that they can continue to have a workforce that uh, meets the demands that they have. And whether it's, I know they have firsthand, you know, workforce issues are so, uh, I guess, severe, and uh, particularly in social service providers, because they typically can't pay a lot of money people are drawn to it because of the work and the mission and we're going to make sure that we uh, are able to reimburse them and provide uh, if not reimbursement through a, a model where they actually are employees provide a, a wage where they can live and do the work that they want to do talk about uh, the recent settlement the 4.3 billion dollar settlement regarding the marketing of oxycontin long overdue uh, i'm obviously quite familiar with the activities of the Sacra family and Purdue Pharmaceutical, and in my opinion, it was sickening. And uh, I give credit to our uh, Attorney General Mara Healy at a time when there was a lot of pressure many months ago to settle with them. She held out, and as a result, the settlement is uh, dollar figures are much higher. But as important, the release of emails and uh, company correspondence of Purdue and how they market it will be made public. And that will shame them. And I think that will be enough, and I hope it's enough, for the federal government to uh, prosecute them criminally for, for what they did. $4.3 billion to them is nothing. And they have done a good job of insulating themselves personally from these types of, of settlements and ultimately judgments as well. I think those will be coming. And it, so it's, it's not a whole lot of money to them, incredibly. And so uh, given what they've done to the families uh, across this country, I, I think criminal charges are in order. But I commend the Attorney General and all those that were involved. It's, uh, I think it's going to be about $90 million for Massachusetts, and that money will be put to use helping people who are impacted by the activities of this, this company. When you read some of the emails, and I had the opportunity to read some uh, uh, several months ago, it, it, is, it is just sickening. My opinion is it's sickening that uh, what they were doing and what they knew, I believe what they knew they were doing. 
that actually leads me to um, marketing um, on a slightly different um, angle, slightly different angle, and that's the uh, flavored tobacco and nicotine products. Yes, so we were the first uh, state in the country to ban all flavored tobacco products. It was considered somewhat controversial. Obviously the industry, the vaping industry, the tobacco industry, they threw everything they had at it once they realized what we were up to. And we stayed under the radar for quite a period of time. And at one point there was a press conference and the word goes that there was a couple lobbyists for the industry who looked at each other and said, where did this come from? We're not going to recover from this, meaning the industry. So we were able to get the law passed first in the country to ban all flavored tobacco products. There was some thought that when it passed, people would just go to New Hampshire. And that is what happened. They initially went to New Hampshire. We predicted what the revenue loss would be here in Massachusetts, and that prediction was pretty accurate. And we did see a spike in sales in New Hampshire. But sales in New Hampshire have now dropped back down to where they were before we put our ban in place. And so our revenue is down. New Hampshire spiked, but is back to normal. Connecticut and other states have not seen a bump in their revenues. So it's pretty clear that there are fewer flavored tobacco products being sold. And we've, COVID will make it difficult to kind of measure the impact on young people and whether fewer of them are vaping or smoking. But we'll know soon uh, the impact there. And uh, we've got a great group that's working in the tobacco control program here in Massachusetts. And I think five and 10 years out, we will look back and see that this was incredibly impactful and has saved a generation from big tobacco and big vape. One of the things that I had noticed is that they uh, initially there were flavor, flavors like bubble gum and flavors that probably you and I wouldn't go for anyway. So then you question what segment of the population would, and that's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious. And, and talking about the inner workings of Purdue and what they were saying to each other, the inner workings of Juul, is they've been exposed as well. And at one point they had a, a decision to make on how they were going to market their product. Were they going to market adults with the idea of this may help you uh, get off of combustible cigarettes, or are we going to market children? And they made the decision to market children. And, uh, and the rest is, is history. As they say, we saw a generation of young people become addicted to nicotine and to combustible cigarettes in increasingly growing numbers. And so hopefully we'll put the brakes on that and we'll um, we'll know, and I, and I think it's going to be uh, have an enormous public health impact in the future. Well, believe it or not, we are at the end of this particular program, but I welcome you to come back on a regular We're basis. You it, yes. Pretty much, yeah, you, you do yes. accept our invitations on a regular Love basis, it. and we certainly appreciate that. Enjoy the remainder of the summer, yes. and we'll touch base uh, in the fall. Great. Thank you at home for watching. Please continue to watch local access television.